Yeah. Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 28th episode of Crypto Wednesdays. Um, we're back. We're back on track after having restarted the show last week, and actually, our subscriber count is up by 25 percent in one week. So that's that's pretty exciting. Uh, today. We have a very special panel. The topic is the gold standard of staking. And we'll introduce my co-host right after we introduce the panel, but we'll start off with the panel. And uh, Bernd, I've known you for many years. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Can you very quickly describe yourself and your co-panelists, and then we'll go into each one more in depth with their background and what they're working on. But I just want to, you know, I reached out to you or you reached out to me about forming this panel and you put it together in re record speed. So just orient us to the topic and the participants, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Gordon. Pleasure seeing you again um, since you thank moved you. to Dubai. So my name is Bernd. I'm uh, in crypto since end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Joined, uh, was lucky enough to join the Ethereum Foundation in 2015 and was on the advisory board there till 2017. And through that got into a lot of projects and um, yeah, I don't want to go too deep, but one of the projects is Avado, and we'll explain that in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, and my co-founder in Avado is Stefan, Stefan Ponet. He lives in Belgium, but he can introduce himself later as well. And through the project or through living in Zug, Switzerland, I met Arthur, Arthur Javet, who is um, deep into research and into security topics. And he can also introduce himself later in, in more depth. And the topic today is the, the gold standard of staking, which is a topic that's uh, deep in our, in our roots if we mm -hmm. use blockchain, because we want to have decentralized systems. And if you don't have a decentralized system, you don't meet the criteria that blockchain wants to propose, like uh, decent, um, uh, the censorship resistance and um, yeah, being, being more resistant in, in general. So we... We focus on decentralization with our own solution. And we think, uh, or the Ethereum Foundation said that home staking, staking on your own device is the gold mm -hmm. standard. And that's exactly what we provide with Avada. But uh, now I'll give back to you, Gordon, to maybe- Well, let, let, let's go. Okay, so Arthur, or Professor Arthur, tell us a yes, little bit about th yourself. Thanks a lot for having me here. Um, I, I do I do research in the in the blockchain space primarily uh, in the information security realm. Um, so anything that really, for example, starts with Bitcoin, like what is a double spend, how to prevent a double spend, how to how to do a, how to provoke a blockchain forks and so on. Uh, this is what what is quite uh, intriguing to me. And in that vein, and I think fitting to to today's panel is uh, how can how is staking secure? How does it remain secure? Um, mm -hmm. As well as how can we quantify or understand the centralization or decentralization aspects of it? Very interesting. And it, we'll, we'll, I really want to go into everyone's background because I always think that's fascinating. It leads to more conversation, but we'll do that on the second swing around. Uh, Stefan, please. Yeah, so um, thanks for having me as well. Um, so I'm the CTO of Avado, so I mostly take care of all the, the, the technical uh, stuff uh, with regards to Avado. I have an IT background myself. I used to be in um, used to have an own company, like a Web2 company, um, then went into blockchain in 2015, then met Berndt, um, yeah, and then uh, started Avado from that. And so the, the previous endeavors that we did also led into Avado, but maybe I can tell a little bit more about that later on. Super. Um, now, one, one of my favorite, and Anastasia, please, my wonderful co-host, before we lead on, uh, she's been kind enough to, hold on, you got to keep yourself, keep yourself unmuted, please, Anastasia. Okay, uh, sure, I will. Okay. And go ahead, please introduce yourself. And I'm very happy to have um, you doing this. Thank you so much, uh, Gordon. It's it's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Anastasia. I uh, do growth management and business development at Yellow Capital. And? And um, um, I don't know. Glad to join the panel. Glad to see Patricia Serki also join. And yep. um, looking forward to an interesting conversation. I might, you know, sometimes be an advocate for uh, people who might not be that deeply technical. So don't mm -hmm. mind certain questions like that. Well, actually, that, that's a perfect lead into my to my next one, 
which is one of my favorite expressions is explain it, explain it to me like I'm five years old. So, exactly. I, you know, here I am a lawyer. I ideally bill $2,000 an hour. And then I tell my clients, explain it to me like I'm five years old, which always makes me wonder if I'm charging too much. But panelists, explain it to me like I'm five years old. What is staking 101? Let's just start at the beginning. We're all familiar with proof of work from Bitcoin. What does staking do for us? And AV3, feel free to jump in. I don't know who wants to take it. <laughs> Guys, it's going to be a short show if, if you're shy. So I need to <laughs> jump, jump in there. Burn. I'm I can, calling I you. can try with an Eli 5, although I'm, I'm, not, Fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm not running a staking uh, facility as, as Burnt and, and, and Stefan does. So. <laughs> but, but, but your background is maybe. security, which relates. So maybe, please jump right. in. Maybe, maybe Bernd and Stefan can refine it after after me. Um, mm -hmm. So Eli, Eli 5 uh, for staking. So mm -hmm. um, Gordon, one thing you said is we all know proof of work in Bitcoin, right? I think that that's that's already helping first step. Or we, from... we, we might know it, but you can even place it and you can start from the beginning. Just what what is staking and why does it matter? I see, right. Um, so in the blockchain, uh, you want to do payments, right? You want to pay from a person A to a person B. And you do not want that you can spend your coin uh, from, from, from A to B and from A to C, right? So you do not want this double spending to happen, right? So you want this one coin only to go to one person uh, and not to two person at the same time, because then your payment system would be broken. Sure. Um, so that's that's the base, right? That's the we want the to, to prevent the double spending. Now, in uh, the stake, is effectively there to prevent that from happening. Right? Is to prevent this kind of malfeasance of happening. Uh, the stake is there in order to secure that you can, if you have a coin, you you spend it from A to B, and and you only spend it to one person and not to multiple persons at the same time, I would say, in a very simplified way. Okay, let's go deeper. Um, Stefan, <laughs> hey, good. That was now, now, now explain to me like I'm six. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so as Arthur already mentioned, so you want to have like honesty in the system, but at the same time, you also want the system to be decentralized. Uh, so you, you rely on a lot of people that you don't know. Um, that's also validate all these transactions so they're going from A to B and not from A to C. So you need people who verify that. Now to uh, to do that, they invented like a sort of a, a gamified system where people get rewards for doing the, the right thing and get penalized for doing uh, things wrong. Now in proof of stake, the idea is that people have to bond uh, a number of, of their tokens. So like in Ethereum, for example, it's 32 ETH that you have to bond to your validator. And as long as you keep on um, attesting correct transactions and proposing correct blocks, then you will receive a reward from the protocol. Now, if you don't do that and you try to uh, insert like a falsified block or a falsified transaction, then you will get slashed. And so slashing means that a, a part of that stake that you actually put in uh, gets burned. So you lose that. Uh, but as you know, like 32 ETH is quite a significant amount of money, I think, for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so now. nobody wants to lose that. So there's like more to gain with doing the right thing than to lose with doing anything wrong into the protocol. And that's sort of the gamification um, that proof of stake introduced in, into blockchain. Um, if you allow me to compare it to proof of work, uh, so the idea with proof of work, so everybody is probably aware of these Bitcoin miners or uh, previously Ethereum miners. And so these very large facilities with uh, thousands of computers consuming an enormous amount of electricity. So the idea there is that by spending electricity um, in uh, to calculate these blocks as well, uh, or to calculate some sort of a puzzle that actually results into these blocks. Um, that is a stake that you put in. So I think right now, I don't know the exact number, but I think it costs about like $8,000 worth of electricity to mine a Bitcoin block. If I'm not mistaken, I could be off. Uh, depends mm -hmm. on the, uh, the mining difficulty and on some other factors, of course. Um, so people have to spend that kind of money on electricity to mine a block in proof of work. 
Uh, so you also don't want to lose that. And so that's sort of the same game, gamified system with proof of work. Uh, and so this is the way that I always compare proof of work with proof of stake. So you have something to lose in proof of work. It's like the work that you've done before that you can lose mm -hmm. if you do something wrong. In proof of stake, it's yeah, the actual stake that you have to put in. The big benefit of proof of stake is that it's much more uh, energy efficient right? because there's no... So the whole proof of work thing, it's just a... Um, sort of a cryptographic puzzle that you're trying to solve. It's not even a cryptographical puzzle, just like a sort of a guesswork that you're doing. Um, and so if you do um, yeah, if you do that kind of work, that is sort of yeah, the same thing as the as a stake that you, that you have to uh, put in. But so the proof of stake, yeah, it just calculates. It's more like a round robin system. So it's like everybody gets a turn proposing a new block and there's no, so you don't have to spend anything like uh, artificially you know, like that electricity that you're that you're burning sort of to to build up that stake in your block because you just deposit the stake right away from the stars so i hope that makes sense for a for a six-year-old well i, I burned now we yeah. add some details no, for a 15 year old no no i i think i i can since those two were explaining it i i really had time to think so I compare it to, um, you know, these child games where you sit around a table, there's a piece of chocolate on the table, everyone has a dice. And if you roll the dice, and the first one who rolls a six is able, can eat the chocolate. And in the meantime, the other kids start to roll the dice again. And then the next one gets a six. That's proof of work. Mm -hmm. That's, um, so everybody is mining, is rolling the dice, rolling the dice, rolling the dice, trying to get the six. And one kid gets to to maybe get a mechanical hand so now he's faster and mm -hmm. and he does it faster so this is how proof of my proof of work mining gets sort of uh, people buy faster hardware to to get um yeah the to get be able to to um, build a block and and uh, mine the block so this is proof of work where you really have to do something and you you have to be active um, to be the one who is chosen then to build the block. In proof of stake, this is a separate, uh, separate set setup. So every kid has to put a deposit, has to pay money, let's say, to get into the circle. And now it's it's not a dice, it's a, it's a bottle that you put in the middle and you just spin the bottle. And then it, it points at one kid. And now this kid is, is the one that can start eating the chocolate. And then you, you flip the, the bottle again and it turns to another kid or maybe the same kid. It's, it's really random. So that's, that's proof of stake. So there's no, uh, the only thing that changes is sort of the, um, the, the participants, as Stefan and, and um, Arthur already said, the participants don't have to be um, active in it. They have to deposit something because they can get uh, slashed, as it's called. They can get money taken away from them from their deposit if they do something wrong. If they try to steal the, the cho more chocolate than they're allowed to, they don't give away the chocolate or anything. So that's sort of the, the analogy I can see that is the, in my way, simple form. Got it. And, and, and Marco, I'm very happy you're here. We're, we're gonna be go to the guest section reasonably soon. Just hold, hold that thought. Um, Marco has some insight, of course, and I think we're happy to see him. The All right. so. Let me repeat back what I what I think I heard, or and maybe I'll add some of my own flavor. Every blockchain network needs some mechanism for establishing consensus as to the state of the network. What's happened in the past? Who owns what? What transactions are valid? What transactions are invalid? In bit in the Bitcoin network, and all these transactions and all the state of the network is the result of the information stored in various blocks that are one following each another in time. You need some way to validate the content of each block and make sure that it's trustworthy before you actually add it to the blockchain and move forward. And with proof of work, it's through a sort of computational heavy lifting where, Burn, to use your, your example, there's sort of an arms race to see who can solve the math problem first. And the consequences of faking it are, it, it, it's more efficient to do correct transactions and earn than it is to cheat the system because the consequence, you're never going to win. With proof of stake, if I understand correctly from uh, Stefan's sense, each validator on that network is in, in essence posting a bond 
the bond is in the form of Ethereum and it's electronically held, but it's like a bond. It's like a guarantee, a performance bond. And then if they are validating or approving transactions that are incorrect, they're going to lose, they're going to forfeit some or all of their bonds. And so there's an economic incentive to only allow correct transactions. And th this, this is a way of getting a bunch of computers that are not under single control, that are decentralized, where the parties don't know each other and have no reason to trust or not trust each other to work in concert through economic incentives. Is that, is that, is that a fair way of putting it? That's a 15-year-old explanation already. That's very good. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> mentally 15, so it's okay. The, um, all right. Now, when you when you say the gold standard in staking, you're implying a hierarchy of staking models. Some are more good, some are less good. That's why I get from when you say something is the gold standard, because maybe something's the lead standard, maybe something's the platinum standard, maybe something's the diamond standard. So when something is the gold standard of staking, let, 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 before we get into specifics, what are the possible weaknesses of staking, especially as opposed to proof of work that one might be concerned about? Um, yeah, it depends on, uh, there's like different aspects of, of looking at it. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, critiques of, of proof of work is that yeah, it, it's not it's not really a proven uh, technology yet. It's, it's pretty nascent in its uh, sense. I think Ethereum, uh, there were other blockchains, of course, before that already worked uh, with, proof of, uh, with proof of stake. Um, but yeah, I think proof of work has been around uh, for a longer time. So I think that's certainly one uh, one risk that there's like a systemic uh, uh, error in there. Uh, um, I'm sorry. I want to uh, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. I, I, just to be clear, proof of stake is the unproven technology, or proof of work is the unproven technology. The proof of stake because it has okay. been it has been long so uh, so long um, as proof of work. Yeah. So. Yeah, the second uh, point of critique that uh, that sometimes uh, uh, arises is that people say that it's sort of a like rich uh, getting richer scheme, mm -hmm. uh, because you need quite it's quite a steep uh, hurdle to pass before you can start staking as a solo validator. So as I mentioned, you need that thirty two ETH, uh, which is certainly not for everybody. Um, so if you don't have that 32 ETH, you're not even allowed to participate. As with proof of work, if you can afford to buy the machine to do the mining. And if you then are able to pay for the operational expenses, then anybody can start. So <clears throat> some people call proof of work also more, let's say accessible or even more democratic system. But mm -hmm. again, I don't uh, agree necessarily with these uh, with these statements, but these are often the one of the uh, two of the critiques that I hear, hear from uh, proof of work with regards to proof of stake. Okay. And then... Within proof of stake itself, what makes a proof of stake? What makes this proof of stake better than that proof of stake? Because the different have, models of proof of stake. Yeah. yeah, mostly it's about the clients. So you need to run the the clients, the nodes, to interact with the blockchain. You need to run them on a computer, on hardware, on a server, and this is where it gets sort of dif or it differentiates because you can run this on a computer that you own and you have at home, which is what we call the gold standard, or you can run it with a third party that owns the, the hardware, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a, like an AWS and a cloud service provider, mm -hmm. or you can even not run the hardware yourself. You just want to stake the 32 ETH, but don't want to use any uh, technology itself. You don't want to run that in any any instance. And this is where you probably go to an, an exchange like a Coinbase or Kraken or Binance and you stake on their um, platform, which is, uh, and the main differences are, so one, if you stake with an exchange, you give them your coins, you give them access, you, you allocate your tokens to their platform which is uh, something that you yeah, should, should almost never do because it, it means they own the private key, they own the access point mm -hmm. for this um, amount of, of uh, crypto that you put there. And then they stake on your behalf. It's like the banking system we have today. I go to the bank, I give them money for um, some, some shares 
in the company and and they uh, then they, I, I have the shares in my account but I don't own them personally so the the, the third party the, the bank or in this case the exchange has access to it uh, so that's sort of the the worst solution you can you can do um, in in regards to access to the crypto mm -hmm. um, then there's the, the the server side solution where you have a cloud service that you use for at least owning the hardware and, and maybe even spinning up the, the client, the node, the, the, the software itself. Um, that is a risk because you also give access to a third party to run this client. So, and at some point we have seen that these service providers sh can shut down your, your client, your access point yes. to, the, to the blockchain. So again, your stake then is is not executed anymore. It, it's still it's you still own the, the tokens, the coins, and if you have the private key and the, the the protocol allows it, you can withdraw, but you will not earn anything. And this access point is critical because you, you want to earn and and you want to keep on earning. So that's why we say the golden standard is to to really own the hardware, and run this on a premise that you own uh, in in your house in your apartment, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, stake through your own client, your own node, and earn the full reward as well. Because the, the reward is also a topic that is um, managed differently. So the, the cost involved for, for staking is the, the, the hardware, the electricity, and the bandwidth. And in case of the exchanges, it's also a fee that they take for providing the service. So they provide the hardware, the bandwidth, and the electricity, and they take a fee for that. And this fee is, is so, mostly- so, so let, let me ask you, the, you know, back in the day, I once downloaded and ran a Bitcoin node just for kicks. And there, there was quite a period of time involved in downloading all the prior blocks and recalculating and just getting it up and running. When you have a, a proof of stake network, for example, Ethereum, is there that initial lift and also once you have it in place and operational, are the ongoing bandwidth requirements that high? Yeah, I can take it or Stefan, you. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe you... I can speak a bit uh, to that. So, um, so proof of work versus proof of, of stake doesn't really change anything with regards to the downloads uh, duration of, of the blockchain. And so you also have to download the whole uh, history of the blockchain if you sync uh, sync of an ethereum node even though it's proof of stake mm -hmm. um so and then with regards to the, the bandwidth requirements uh so it's uh, like there are like a couple of things that need to be in sync so in, in ethereum if like there's like the network is consists out of two uh let's say segments one is the execution layer there were all the transactions take place and like the the smart contracts run on and so forth and then you have the beacon chain, which is what they call the consensus layer. And that sort of does all the all the ins and outs of the proof of work system and, and sort of arranges who needs to propose the next block and so forth. Uh, both of them have like a history of blocks and, and slots that, um, that are already there. So you also need to sync that up. So in the beginning, so the so right now, if you would sync an Ethereum node, you would be looking at a download of about one terabyte of data, which is like pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And then if you continuously run uh, these things, it takes about yeah two to three terabytes of data, uh, so of of yeah of data per month uh, to keep those things in sync. So it's I mean, pretty, it's not that much. Uh, no, it's I mean usually like over, over a month. Here, in Europe, for example, we, we mostly have like uncapped internet connections here. So there's no mm -hmm. data limit. Uh, so we, even though, uh, just as an example, so my bandwidth is actually quite low. So we're still on like VDSL technology here in Belgium primarily. So there's no glass fiber or fiber connections here uh, to the home yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means that I only have like uh, an upload speed of let's say 100 megabits a second and 35 megabits of download speed. Mm -hmm. And I can easily run you know, like three of these Avado instances, so like complete uh, copies of that Ethereum blockchain simultaneously on that line without 
probably without uh, any interruption so we can still uh, do netflix and, and all the all the rest of the bandwidth requirements that uh, goes so, with so the you're, you're like a staking whale well, no, I'm just a developer, so that means that I have to uh, run a lot of these, uh, a lot of this infrastructure also for testing purposes. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm a pretty uh, uh, big consumer of bandwidth, let's say. Uh, but even though with with a relatively small internet connection that I have here, um, mm -hmm. I can still pull it off. And maybe like there's like two more uh, additions that I wanted to say to what Ben was uh, was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. um, is first of all that the so I think an, an important difference is from uh, so these different versions of, of staking, so going from the gold standard up to just dropping your coins at an exchange, is that mm -hmm. uh, so what Bernd explains as running the client itself is um, also entails that you run and have your have possession of your own keys. So if I run my validator at home as I'm mm -hmm. doing. Um, I created my own deposit keys. I also have my own withdrawal keys. So, so the, my cryptographical keys are mine and mine alone. So nobody else knows them. So nobody can steal the 32 E bonds that I that I put in. As long as I keep my own keys safe, of course, because mm -hmm. let's assume that. Um, as as opposed to if I go to an exchange and I just give them my coins, they will create um, the keys for me, and so they will actually own. The whole uh, they will have the let's say the full control over that. Um, and the second small remark is that our addition to what Baron said is that so the, the risk of staking at an exchange is that you also have decentralization risk. So the centralization risk and decentralization. So a centralization risk in the sense that um, if a lot of people give all their coins to that one exchange. Like the proportion, so like the whole, the percentage of the amount of stake that they have in the whole network mm -hmm. might become proportionally big, and so it's like a single player. So it's like one party that. That's interesting. Like I hadn't thought about that to be honest. And, and by the way, thank you everyone for all our guests for joining. Uh, we're at the beginning part of the show where we're doing the the panel portion, but in 15, 20 minutes, or so we're going to open it up to all the guests and have you unmute yourself. So please keep your ears and mind engaged during this portion, and then we'll we'll open it up. I see Alex. I say, Mayor, I, I see Marco, we, we, Rick, we got a great group here. So, and Binet, we got it. This is going to be exciting. These are these are top minds. So, it's great. But, um, Stefan, you, you raised an interesting point. I, I guess it's obvious, but I hadn't really thought it through before, which is when you have exchanges or large third, third party providers staking for you, you're re centralizing in a way a decentralized network because that's now an attack point or, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a company with humans. And operations and equipment that is concentrated, so it can be subject to legal risk, can be subject to, you know, bad guys getting in there. That that that's that is troubling for the network at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, and let's also not forget that there is also a lot of uh, let's say social uh, coherence in, in that whole community or in these different communities. I'm now talking about Ethereum specifically, but you you see the same uh, kind of coherence in uh, in in other ecosystems as well that also have uh, proof of stake mm -hmm. or that, that use it. Uh, in the sense that people in the Ethereum space are aware of these centralizations, these centralization risks. Mm -hmm. um and so they also try to like mitigate that by just like talking to each other and like uh like sort of bringing down the the idea to to stake your coins at exchanges and so forth so it's really um discouraged uh to do these things so there's also a lot of like education going on, uh, trying to show people how they can stake and how they can stake mm -hmm. at home and I think like we with avado are also contributing uh modestly to that um but yeah so it's it's also i these things tend to self-regulate uh, to some extent in the sense that people are aware of decentralization risks and if if things go like too much into one direction like it's getting called out and people are starting to act on that and take away their coins at certain services and maybe restaking them at other um providers or maybe start running their own validators at home uh, ideally and so like that's again evolving towards that uh, toward that golden standard of staking 
That, that, that's interesting because you know, in, in American English, we have the expression that you can vote with your feet, which is there's there's voting with government, but there's also voting with your feet, like I did to go to Dubai and get out of, get out of Los Angeles. So you're yeah. you're talking to, you're talking about people voting with their with their tokens by pulling their stakes or maybe their delegation of stake from operations that they feel yeah. aren't ideologically aligned with the best practices. But, exactly. but I think that people are most of, most of the times we don't Avado as if we sell Avado we don't talk about you will decentralize the system we, we mostly talk about the return of investment because mm -hmm. we want to decentralize the system with our solution but people don't care about that as much as as maybe we hope they they would so I think people will go where it is most convenient to stake and and where they get. A good return of investment they might choose against the system that gives them a higher return of investment if they have to sort of do more to get this um be be active more active in that or to to keep the system decentralized and and so i think that people will always go more for convenience first and yes. and that's what what we also try to solve so the the challenge we have with home staking and the gold standard is that you really have to run something yourself. You have to do this yourself at some point. And we want to um, try to, to limit the threshold of this active participation is also the, the, the technology knowledge uh, or the technological knowledge of the user. We want to lower that threshold as, as much as possible. That's how we started in, in 2018 with Avado because we back then we wanted to give Developers, like, like Stefan said, he runs several nodes, several clients, because he's a developer and he needs that. We did that exactly for that reason. There was no staking solution uh, around that was interesting. So we, we built this solution to help developers run nodes so that they don't have to worry about that part and, and really focus 100% of their time on building, building solutions on blockchain. But over time, we've turned into a more interesting topic yeah sorry Go yeah, we're, 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 i'm gonna do a complete deep dive on avado in, in about three or four minutes uh professor you're you're, you're looking intelligent and thoughtful but I, i'd love to know what your internal dialogue is on this topic how do you look intelligent <laughs> i don't know you, you have a uh, physical but, look on your face no just kidding um so i i i really enjoyed your your discussion i think one thing that i that i uh, picked up was um, the Bitcoin example that you meant uh, that you uh, that you have um, um, talked about earlier that it takes like weeks to sync, right? Um, we can, similar to how we can compromise kind of decentralization, we can um, we can also compromise on the trust assumptions by having, for example, a set of um, a, a set of uh, checkpoints so that we can sync faster uh, Bitcoin peer. And actually, I, I just synced the Bitcoin note last week out of fun. Um, and, uh, it took only a few hours, um, which, uh, which means there are like a bunch of optimizations you can do to, to speed up syncing of, of blockchain peers in general, um, while yes, slightly sacrificing trust to some degree, right? Uh, because the only, the only, um, oh, let's say the most secure way of syncing a blockchain would be to sync it from the Genesis block onwards. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Put it simply, so to speak. Interesting. Um, okay, now let's deep dive Avado. Again, like on five, what specifically is it? Is it a device? Is it a platform? What is it? It's hardware. So it's a mini PC that you buy. You you pay once. You buy. You you pay the price for a, a very good mini PC. So it's has an i7 or an R9 CPU. It has a lot of storage. Um, like it starts with two terabyte of storage and goes up to 16 terabyte mm -hmm. that you can buy. So we have different specs. It has 32 or 64 gigabyte of memory. Um, so it's, it's really capable of um, running one client or even several clients in, in some cases as different blockchains on the same device. And you, you buy the device from us you uh, plug it into your router that it has internet and it needs electricity. That's, that's the two things it needs. 
Um, Stefan can go more deeply into the technical parts. I, I want to spoil that for him so he can he can go on that. But the the thing that makes it very interesting is that it we integrate in a app store, how we call it. So it's like you're on your mobile phone. You have an app store. You have different mm -hmm. applications, and that's the same same way you look at at um, Avado. So you open the app store, and then you have all these clients in line. You have a Bitcoin, you can download Bitcoin client just for verification, not for mining. You can uh, download Ethereum client. You can have Avalanche, Quantum, Gnosis. There's different um, blockchains that we that we integrated. And uh, some of them you can stake, some of them you just have the access to the blockchain. And we also have other applications that need a network of peer-to-peer -peer devices being connected. There's a, a project called Hopper that is a communication platform where you can use uh, this in the future to communicate. It's, it's almost like a WhatsApp solution that you can build with them um, that is too, truly decentralized and, and censorship resistant and so on. Um, then there's other projects like a VPN provider that, that you can give access to other people to your internet connection. And you can earn. So the, the the basic idea we had after we solved the problem for the developers was mm -hmm. that we wanted people to earn crypto because we feel that it's it's sometimes hard for people to understand that they have to invest or put money into something that they don't understand. But if we if you can just simply run a machine and earn crypto in a passive way that you don't even have to do anything, this would onboard more and more people to the to this blockchain ecosystem and uh, allow more people to interact with it and then proof of stake came and that's what we are focusing on now uh, since uh, 2020 at least that we um, have different platforms blockchains that you can stake on and again these the solution is is so that we take you through the process of of each of these projects or programs so if you click on on ethereum staking then it, it takes you through the process of generating your keys um, depositing the 32 ETH, and then you can also see the progress uh, of your stake. But all the maintenance, all the, the, the software updates are still something we do for the whole community. So if there's like a, a fork, like the Chapella just happened uh, last week, that, that is covered by our own update and maintenance system. And now I give to Stefan and he can maybe give some more technical details if that's interesting. Yeah, maybe I just like, also want to sort of like touch the the sort of the 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 bottom line of what we are trying to achieve. So we are really like providing staking hardware nowadays. So it's really like if you uh, so again that that's Sha Chapella hard fork last week. So exactly mm -hmm. one week ago now was like a sort of a pivotal moment for Ethereum because it was like the conclusion of their transition to proof of stake. Uh, so the thing that, that Chapella hard fork enabled was to also withdraw your stake. That was not uh, possible beforehand. So the staking has been around really? on Ethereum about uh, two years. So people that deposited two years ago on like on the Genesis block of uh, proof of stake, uh, they didn't actually know when they would be able to withdraw their 32 eat stake again. So now, so, uh, I'm sorry, week... let me jump in for a second. So taking Burns example, suppose you stake with someone else either your delegate or use their hardware or, or something and then that staker goes that validator goes offline were you just out of luck this entire time or were you able to somehow redelegate or restake no and so in the case of ethereum these coins were locked until that's that hard fork now so everybody who started staking uh, two years ago they they took like quite some risk or they, they, they had a very firm belief that everything will uh, will go smoothly after uh, that time but they, but they I, I, i'm sorry but I, I, i'm asking you sort of a narrow question suppose you delegate or stake with a particular provider not in general i'm not questioning staking in general but a particular provider goes down does your allocation or with that provider is that locked until you got until this um hard fork took place or were you somehow able to recover your Ethereum, your 32 and restake? No, it was locked, but it even got worse than that. So if your provider would go out of business or, or something like that, um, assuming that they would still hold on to your keys and, and allow you to withdraw uh, since last week, 
is that your validator would also like bleed out. So if you do your duties, then you get these rewards. So if you stop doing your duties, so even if you don't uh, try to force a false block or a false transaction into the blockchain, if you just like stop doing your work, mm -hmm. your validator is also like bleeding out uh, on these on these the rewards that you that you received, and also on the bonds that you put in. So if you put in the thirty to eat, if you activate a validator, and if you would stop doing anything, then so. Also, if you give it to somebody else and, and they would stop doing it, uh, then like your 32 ETH will slowly like bleed away and leak out of your validator until you're at 16 ETH and then you would be like kicked out of the network and then your 16 ETH would be there for withdrawal. But again, also that, that's for a withdrawal nightmare. after that Shabella hard fork. Yeah, so that means that people that staked in the beginning, they were like very firm believers in, in Ethereum. Uh, to take on that kind of risk, of course. Well, and, it sounds very, like uh, horrible and go ahead. It sounds Please. like horrible and beautiful in the same way. Because, like, imagine putting your money on a deposit in a bank, but not knowing whether or when you will be able to withdraw it. Like, no one would ever do that. Yet, with Ethereum, there, there turned out to be so many people who did. Yeah, they were like, uh, I don't know how much it was. It's like $2 billion or so sort of that was staked in the beginning, depending on the, the time frame that you look at in the, the Ethereum price. Um, so there were like a lot of people that had that firm belief. Uh, like me, I, myself, for example, included. So I also staked from uh, from a Genesis block on the, on, the, on the Beacon chain on Ethereum. So I also had the, the strong faith in the in the whole community that that they would pull it off, and like mm -hmm. we were proven right uh, since last week. And the, you can see there's other networks that don't have this withdrawal restriction. Um, you can see by the uh, the the percentage of stake to um, sort of uh, available currency in, in that protocol, you can see that Ethereum had like 14% of all the Ethereum uh, available was staked. And that's that's really not a lot until mm -hmm. now. So I don't know the numbers right now, but uh, before Chapella, and you see other networks that, that have more than 50 or even 60, 70% staked. I think uh, Cardano even has 90% staked probably because you cannot do much with it, but- I was about to um, say, you, I, does it still not have smart contracts? I don't know. I, I'm not uh, going to, to comment on that, but it's just an, an indicator as well that people were had to be strong believers in the system and, and in the capacity and, and capability of the, the Ethereum uh, community to, to really pull this off. So that's, that's why only 14% were staking um, uh, of, or 14 percent of the uh, available amount was staked. In other networks, this is much higher. And and I believe, and I haven't looked at the numbers yet, but I believe that this number will go uh, significantly up now because it, it sure. has shown that it's possible. And mm -hmm. and now withdrawals, there's not much risk right now. Only with the exchange, if you go with an exchange, that the exchange might. All right. So um, walk, walk me through the economics. So I suppose I want to run. First of all, can I run Avado at home now? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, okay, so fine. I, I you know, burn you, you send me an Avado, I plug it into the wall or I buy it from you. W what does it cost to buy it? Say the base. It model. That we, we have a device from starting from $1,600, mm -hmm. and that's two terabytes, uh, i7 CPU, 32 gigabyte of RAM, and that's capable of, of running Ethereum. Um, so the, the two terabyte will. That's sort of the limiting factor is the storage, uh, because the, the the block you have to, as we said before, you have to sync the blockchain. It's around about one terabyte right now, and it's growing um, rapidly. So it, it might be in in one or two years, the two terabyte might be um, full. So we then you have to replace the the device or have to replace the storage at least. Um, and um, but all you need is electricity and, and bandwidth, the internet, and and 32 ETH at least. Or, and this is also something that uh, sort of evolved in the Ethereum ecosystem. You have a lot of liquid staking providers mm -hmm. that um, allow you to stake 16 ETH or even less. Stefan, you want to say something? 
Yeah, maybe before we take that uh, that leap into uh, liquid staking providers, maybe there's a couple of things that I want to add uh, with regards to the the economics. So, so the thing is, uh, so you buy the device for so it starts at sixteen hundred USD. There's a very important uh, nuance there that is that on one device you can you can stake as much as you want. And so each validator that you want to run requires you to have thirty two ETH. But imagine that you would have sixty four ETH. Then you can just spin up two validators or add two of these validation keys into the same Avado hardware. So you don't have to buy an additional hardware device for each slot that you want to take. So if you just have a whole uh, whole bag of Ethereum sitting around and you want to stake it, so one Avado device is enough to accommodate up to hundreds of, uh, of validators on, on one hardware. So it's not more, it doesn't require any extra um cpu power or whatnot to run more than one validator so that's one important aspect in your roi calculation then okay so sorry, just, just, just super fast the the when, at least when it comes to processor bandwidth and i guess also hardware the, the size of your stake is non-correlated with your hardware requirements is that correct exactly yeah okay so you need like you need like a minimum a hardware spec to be able to run that Ethereum system. And that's what we've created. So we've created that that's, and figured out what kind of hardware, what kind of storage it needs and so forth. So it's like a pre-configured device. So we've done all the work with Avado to figure out what the best hardware configuration or configurations are uh, to do it. Um, so that's sort of the, um, the thing that you buy from us. And then you can start staking. Uh, so uh, so Bernd mentioned the price, 1600 USD for like the, the basic, the most basic model, which normally like in normal circumstances would allow you to stake for the next three years, which is about the, the expected lifespan of such a device. It's, a, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's like your PC you also replace it every so many years. So within that three years, so if you amortize that uh, $1,600 on three years, uh, if you look at the rewards that you would get, so if you would run one validator with 32 ETH, that will yield you uh, on a yearly basis about 1.1 ETH. So at current ETH prices, that's like $2,200 approximately. Um, so, so anywhere in the ballpark of $2,000. So that means in less than one year, you sort of have paid back that whole investment of like $1,600. And then the whole rest of the, the lifespan of the device, so two years plus, is just like the benefit that, that you have because there's we consider that there's no additional costs of running the hardware because the electricity that it consumes it's minimal so mm -hmm. the i7 hardware that I mentioned it takes about 10 watts of electricity so it's it's of course sort of the same as charging your mobile phone or a little more but not uh, not much more than that so it's a very small and lightweight appliance uh, the bandwidth requirements as i mentioned you already pay for your internet subscription and it just taps into that. So there's no additional costs that you have to pay. So it just consumes a little bit more of your existing internet connection. So there's also no extra fee that you have to pay for that. Um, Actually, so I, let, let me I, ask you a question. There's a perennial issue with Bitcoin miners that they there's an arms race in the technology in the, in the ASICs. And what was cutting edge six months ago is trash today. Does that dynamic apply to proof of stake machines or is it mitigated? No, that's mitigated by that the idea that you have to put up a bond in um yeah, so in, in these coins. So the, the only correlation that there might be is that the more stakers there are, the smaller the the percentage of ROI on Ethereum is that, that you get. So it's like this is curve that slowly uh fades out sort of so like if more and more people start staking they have to sort of divide the same amount of rewards uh in a bigger group so it's logical that anybody gets a, a smaller cut of the uh, piece of the pie sort of okay. so it's basically like in bitcoin there was like the mining difficulty but here in proof of stake we don't have the mining difficulty but still if more people join in the reward would be reduced yeah, but so that curve like goes down very, very slowly. So in the beginning, it was like more steep. So like at Genesis, I think your ROI was around, I think, 12, 13% or so on, on your stake. And now it's at sort of the basis um, 
four yeah, or five. Okay. The fourth is like around yeah, somewhere between three and four. I think it's a three point six right now. <laughs> I think I checked it this morning still. Um, and so coming back to sharp. Well, yeah. Please go ahead. No, 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 that that was sort of the point I was making. So, so, so coming back to Sharpala, um, you you mentioned earlier that because at the beginning when the proof of stake just started, you were basically locking your Ethereum for unknown period of time, and so there were only like fifteen percent of ETH that were staked, and now that we have this like more certainty about the unlock, you think that the percentage of ETH that will be staked will be higher. So potentially this uh, curve will actually, you know, um, go down faster. So the, re the rewards would be uh, becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, yeah, that's true. But it's it's not like it's going to 1% or anything like that. It's maybe going to 3.3, uh, 3.2, 3 uh, those kind of, of numbers. So there are still... I mean, there is an economic incentive uh, to do this, but also if you look at Bitcoin, there's also at the certain points, there's an equilibrium between that uh, the, the mining difficulty. Uh, so more if more and more miners join, that the mining difficulty goes up. So it also means that the cost of, of mining a Bitcoin block goes up. At a certain point, people say, yeah, I'm not willing to invest more in this infrastructure to secure the network because I, I will run uh, it's sort of uh, I will run at the loss there. So there's this equilibrium that takes place, and I can also see that play out in staking because people need to like lock in that 32 eat per validator at a certain point. If there's like really too many people that would start validating, and the percentage that anybody would get would be so low that people say, yeah, there's better ways for me to invest my 32 eat. That yields me more than that maybe two percent or so that I would get at that time. But I think there's also this idea of, of uh, equilibrium that will take place. Um, you know. Interesting. Uh, guys, let me we're, let's shift to the second portion of the show. This has been fascinating, but I want I, we really do have a great audience. So I want to bring them in. Uh, Marco, I'm gonna start with you just because I know you have a lot to say, you always do. So I'm gonna ask you to join. How are you doing? Good, but you know everyone. Mm -hmm. Unless unless you're inappropriate, I want to see your face. Yeah, but you can't because you're disabled my camera. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> you should be able to do it now. Okay, here, try again. not. Try, try, try. <coughs> right now. <coughs> hey, All right, trying again. Hey, hey, there we go. I got. Okay, it. Marco, do you want to put on a shirt or is that just like asking too much? No, <laughs> you know me, Gordon. I don't put on shirts yeah, before sure nine a.m. Okay, that's good. Right, go on. Anyway, it's good to see you. How you hey, doing, man? It's been ages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good. Okay. Well, Mark's uh, Mark. Hey, Mark and Marco, so go. Talk to us. Uh, yeah, it's it's I mean, I I, I was uh, sort of chuckling at the at the metaphors being used to describe the deltas between uh, proof of work and proof of stake. Uh, because it, it really is a simple thing. The uh, a blockchain doesn't need to understand that cannot know who the next block producer is. Right. That, that's the key. That's the key. Everyone's trying to solve proof of work does it because everyone's trying to solve the same puzzle and no one knows who's going to solve it first. So that's the way you randomize in a reliable manner, the next block producer. And therefore no one knows if they're going to be the next block producer in proof of stake, um, pure proof of stake. It's you have a large pool of people who have all staked and are promising they won't do bad things by putting up a stake that says that they will pay if they do. Um, but you have a less reliable method of randomizing who the next producer is. So there is a you're pitting a trade-off in overall network security to get more efficient use of electricity, for starters, and a swifter uh, response on block production. Uh, because obviously uh, validating a block is very, very quick. Um, coming up with a solution to a puzzle takes time and effort. Uh, with uh, proof of stake, you've lost that time and effort problem. So you can now produce blocks a lot faster, but you've given up the security of not being able to uh, easily predict the next block producer. So there's a bit of a, I mean, it's, it, they're, they're, we're talking about relative scales here, but it, that, that, that is the fundamental delta. When you get to delegated proof of stake, which is different from proof of stake, uh, then you end up with an even more reduced security because the pool of actual block producers 
is much smaller. And it's not because it has to be smaller. It's because human laziness says it's going to be smaller. I don't want to run my own uh, validator if I can just give my coins to somebody else and they'll do it for me <laughs> for a small fee. Uh, so that's so I'm a, I'm a, from a security scale, proof of work is the most secure. Proof of stake is the next most secure, but a heck of a lot more efficient. And then delegated proof of stake is even less secure. For the network? For the network. Okay. Because the so predictability of who the next block producer is mm -hmm. increases as you go down that ramp, right? Proof of work, nearly impossible to predict. Proof of stake, more diff less difficult, but not easy. Delegated proof of stake, you can run some probability games and depending on your, your network's configuration, it can become fairly simple to predict whether or not you're gonna be the next block producer. Okay, now again, explain to me like I'm five, knowing who the next block producer is decreases network security, why? Because that person will be one of the people who knows that they're the next block producer and they can and now custom craft a block if they wish that might get past the validation process, but is in fact a nefarious block. So they can okay. like manipulate the exact validator to verify a blog that has been like malfunctioned or like with some wrong information yeah. basically. Right. All right, let, let me let me bring in uh, Bogdan. Can you feel free to join? And then show your video and we'll happy to have you on the show. Good to see you guys, pleasure. Good to see you. So yeah. actually I have a comment. Uh, so regarding, uh, uh, my name is John, by the way. Uh, so regard, regarding, uh, th there's a big problem with uh, proof of work, uh, specifically that you can see this with Bitcoin. Uh, as uh, through time, uh, you need more and more computing powers uh, in order to do the validating and actually earn something from uh, mining. And this leads to the increased size of the capacities uh, that are doing the mining. So even right now, in order to make any significant money from mining, you need to have a giant warehouse uh, where you have where you use a ton of electricity, etc. And this fully uh, diminishes uh, the special validation <laughs> parts and the anonymity parts. Uh, therefore, uh, even right now, I think if you give my carbon trouts. Uh, the needed information he can find all of the people who are doing uh, uh who are doing blockchain mi bitcoin mining uh in the world right now and if you can find these people and there is not such a big amount of people who are doing most of the validation of transactions uh for bitcoin you can manipulate the system by i don't know uh doing uh something bad to their family or something like that because it's easy to find them if you need a giant warehouse and you use a ton of electricity it's super easy to find you and with proof of stake you can do proof of stake from any computer. You just need to have the uh, significant amounts of a specific coin uh, in order to do that. Comments? I would argue that there's a fallacy there uh, in the sense that there are lots of places that are massive data centers that are doing proof of stake. That is Mining true. companies in general don't just do Bitcoin. They do anything that is profitable for, for the unit electricity and heat management that they have to deal with. I agree with you, by the way, that Bitcoin has had a problem, but Bitcoin doesn't mandate billions of computers necessarily. You could run Bitcoin with a thousand computers. In, you know, a thousand PCs could run Bitcoin because the puzzle difficulty would just adjust. It's an economics thing. And you're right, uh, the Nakamoto coefficient for Bitcoin is, I think, 0. 0.0006. It's ridiculously centralized. Um, All right, now, uh, again, then, explain to me, sorry, Marco, hold on a second, because I keep on hearing that term bandied about, and I've never, I'm so lazy, I never Googled it. So, like okay. I'm five, the Nakamoto, Nakamoto coefficient. Okay, well, the, the Nakamoto coefficient is derived from the Nakamoto score. The Nakamoto score is how many participants in the network are necessary to control the network. Mm -hmm. The Nakamoto coefficient is how many uh, of the, what the, the Nakamoto score divided by the number of participants in the network. Okay, so the Nakamoto, the first one is the absolute number and the second one is yes. the proportional number. Is that correct? Correct, okay. right. Yes. And so if you look at Bitcoin, there are six entities at least last, last time I looked, which is about six months ago, there were six entities that collectively controlled more than 51% of the hash rate. 
Are they all? And how many of them are in were, China? There were well over uh-huh. ten thousand. Uh, well, <laughs> funny enough, one, the Chinese government. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, I call it red coin. Yeah, the, but then you divide that by the number of actual participants in the in the network doing the mm-hmm. proof of work, right? And you know you ignore hash rate because it's about control of uh, uh, control of uh, hash power. And there's about last time I looked, it was well over ten thousand participants in the uh, in the network. So your Nakamoto coefficient is six over ten thousand, which is point oh 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 six, uh, at least as, as a rough estimate, right? Now if you get into um, proof of stake world, pure proof of stake, then you would take the number of uh, proof of stake uh, validators required to control the network, which would be in a true proof of stake would be 67%. So is there any entity controlling 67 or a collection of entities uh, controlling 67% of the validators? <clears throat> because if there is, they can have an almost guarantee that they can they can control the network because they will always win a consensus vote um, within a, within a validator system. And so you've got this sixty seven percent is your Nakamoto coefficient in a in a in a uh, proof of stake world. The only question is uh, after that is how uh, that's on an individual node basis. But if you say, okay, well, Joe Blow over there, he controls 20% of the validators, and this guy over here controls uh, 50% of the validators for you know, argument's sake, you've got two guys who collectively control more than 67%. And you've got, say, Ethereum is sitting somewhere around 100,000 validators. So you've now got two guys who collectively control um, more than 67%. So the Nakamoto score is two, and the number of validators is 100,000. So uh, the Nakamoto coefficient is even smaller. What uh, you're shooting for, I'll, the, I'll, what I'll you're shooting for is a Nakamoto here. score that is close to one, which means there's you would need 67% of the participants in a network to control the network. Okay. Uh, professor, do, do you have a favorite consensus mechanism? What, what's, your, what's your take on all this? We, oui. um, you're asking for my opinion or for objective <laughs> properties? Well, I, I, since you are a professor, I assume your opinion is objective. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> There's a hell of an assumption. I, 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 I do you believe me? And Benet, I'm happy to see your face. It's been a long time. We're going to bring you into this in a second. The the powerful sure. and and slightly intimidating Benet is going to join us and tell us about hex about hexa yurts and stuff like that. But anyways, professor. You're back. The spotlight's on you. Hi, hi, Vinay. No, I think the discussion has been really good uh, and and uh, and also very factual. Um, I I can just agree that the, uh, for example, the high level observation, not that proof of stake in general is likely more secure than proof of stake. I think this is this is likely true. Um, we have analyzed at least in in the the community has analyzed proof of stake protocols quite in depth. Um, mm-hmm. We do understand. How how secure, for example, Bitcoin is in Ethereum uh, in in comparison to Ethereum proof of work, right? So the proof of work to proof of work comparisons have been done quite thoroughly. Um, the proof of stake um, security analyzes have not been done or have not yet been understood that well. So, for example, we um, I think it's very hard also to compare proof of stake protocols with each other. By the way, right? Uh, if you take any proof of stake protocol of, of any major chains nowadays. And you want to know which one is more secure under which circumstance or against which adversary? It's really hard, right? You, like to to build like a comprehensive model that would compare them objectively. It's it's just really tricky. And okay, no, so I'm, that, I'm sorry. I mean, is that not a source of fantastic concern? I mean, if you can't even absolutely. rate them against each other, and we're trying to move the world economy and world computing onto the blockchain, you're, you're making me question that this whole exercise is premature. Uh, I'm just saying we we don't have that much in depth understanding as we have, for example, in proof of work, uh, and that's partially natural due to the fact that well, proof of work in as we know in in the Nakamoto consensus is just a bit older, right? So there was more time, but it's also due to the fact that these protocols are just inherently different in in the way that they're designed, and they're inherently more complicated in the way that they're designed. I mean, proof of work as as Satoshi did is just so simple, right? And 
I love simple things. I'm a simple man, right? Um, but uh, but uh, but I also like the efficiency that we have from from proof of stake in in, in especially the energy aspects. Uh, yet we need to we need to really work harder to understand the, the security better. But Gordon, um, or or, or maybe we can to... just ask ChatGPT and we can base our lives on what it says. I I tried already, Gordon, but uh, it you doesn't tried? Okay. <laughs> It doesn't know. <laughs> Uh, it, it, yet, it, it, it could just try to game us so that it can get the most staking rewards and we're just supporting the network. Uh -huh. yeah. let's, let's just get this off the table. Chat GPT only knows what everybody has written on the internet up to September of 2021. And let's be fair. If you go back and read the internet, you'll realize there's a heck of a lot of contradicting information, if you can call it information, out there about everything. Marco, so I, Chat I, I was kind of was kinda, was kinda joking, handicap. but I'm, I'm glad I riled you up. Uh, I think I see John Bogdan. I feel like you raised, did you raise your hand? Yeah. Do you want to come? Raising my hand. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Question and what do you guys think about ability of uh, teams to update protocol without uh, any consensus? So basically, like with, with like Solana or with Polygon, uh, the team has an ability to uh, update uh, the code of the chain uh, without any consensus happening. As I understand, Ethereum also had this ability uh, before. A lot of <coughs> have, uh, have this ability as well. And so basically, no matter what your consensus is, if the team can update the protocol, then uh, what is the sense of a consensus if somebody has uh, an ability to update the code? So just, just so I understand the question, then we'll pass it to the group. You're, you're not necessarily talking about directly updating prior blocks. You're talking about updating the code base, which would have the effect, perhaps, of changing the prior reality or the prior consensus. Yes. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, audience? Or He's guess, correct. Or anyway. Yeah. This, I mean, could, yeah, this could never so. happen. Never. <laughs> Is that sarcasm? Uh, well, the, that's a joke about the uh, Ethereum for environment. Well, you, you, I mean, right, remember 2016, there was the DAO crisis. In oh, I, 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 I was with Vlad after. Zampir when that was happening. I was with, with Vlad yeah. Zampir in Odessa drinking yeah. vodka yeah. as they were having the community debate about whether code is actually law or just kind of law. And I see Absolutely. it now it's kind of law. Well, it depends. You know, if it, if the Ethereum Foundation had gone in the other direction, code would have been law. Yes, it the would decision have been. to revert is in many ways Ethereum's original sin. Yeah. Now, does that thin the? I've heard this argued. Oh, fine. Let's go. Let's go down this rabbit hole since I think it kind of addresses the question. Okay, was that a moment in Ethereum's growth where that sort of need to happen in order to get to where it is now, or is it forever stained? which I find a little bit um, hard to believe. It's also much that it's forever stained, but what it did was it established the fact that the Ethereum community was uh, theoretically responsible in a way that it really shouldn't have been. So from a regulatory perspective, having the ability mm -hmm. to reverse a transaction and then only choosing to use that uh, uh, once puts you kind of in a different legal position. Sure. So... You know, if they had simply claimed code as well, we have no ability to revert the transaction, shit happens, then it would have established a sort of different cultural line in Ethereum. And I think also to some degree a different legal line. Okay, now to, to address the question that was just raised, how does that reflect on, I guess, Solana's very active ability, not just sort of latent, to go in there and change mm -hmm. the code base and maybe affect the outcome of our prior blocks? What's so, your take on that? I mean, in all of these instances, the people that you have to convince to operate are the miners. Mm -hmm. So if you can persuade the miners that they're going to run the new version of software that does the new thing, uh, or the stakers, right, either the stakers or the miners, you have to convince the people that are securing the network that you're going to change the network protocol and you have to get them to agree to upgrade their software to your new proposed standard. Mm -hmm. uh, if you hit an impasse and they simply refuse, at that point, they control the network, not the people who are writing the software for the network. Mm -hmm. Now, that set of people that are acting essentially as electors, right? In a very distributed network, it's a lot of people. In a very small network with a you know tiny little Nakamoto uh, factor, then it's a very small number of people, right? In the case of something like Solana, I don't know what the exact situation is, but it might be three people. Um, so you know, I mean, you know, putting your lawyer hat on which people have the actual control of the network kind of tells you what rules you're playing by. Mm -hmm. So Ethereum in the current mode 
appears to have largely handed control of the network to exchanges. Right. The exchanges are hosting, you know, holding all of these people's mm. coins, and then they're basically running, you know, staking nodes on behalf. That essentially puts the exchanges in charge of the Ethereum network. The exchanges are then regulated by US federal government. And that then indirectly puts US federal government in charge of the Ethereum network, which has made a lot of people very unhappy as you've seen things like OFAC regulation begin to be applied to transactions. So uh, let, let, let me I, give you let me give you my since you brought it up, I'll give you my lawyer take on this. There, there's multiple vectors of legal analysis on this. My mm -hmm. standard way of looking at chains and tokens is is it a security? And I know you're getting to more than that, but let me let me address that first. I really like the model of one entity coming up with the software and then the community taking that software and on its own launching the network or not. And the software publisher being distinct from the launching group, oligop oligopoly or whatever you want to say, oligarchy. Um, mm -hmm. And the software publisher having influence but not control. I, I like that because when the key tests unless the SEC goes overboard about whether something is a security under the Howey test, is, is there a common enterprise? Well, Absolutely. if you have a fantastically fractured community, a truly democratic, decentralized, you know, with competing interests mm. who don't always agree, it's actually great when they don't agree because you have strong evidence that you don't have a common enterprise. So when you launch this thing, finally, you have a good argument that's not a security. Now, Absolutely. you're, it, I think one of the concerns with, the moving from proof of work to proof of stake on the Ethereum network is the SEC previously made an interesting comment. They made an interesting concession. They said something can start centralized and as a security, but when it's sufficiently decentralized, it may cease to be a security, which is neat because you know that's like an apple turning into an orange. Well, now <laughs> Ethereum may have it's done the SEC's equivalent of transubstantiation. Yes, that would exactly. Be the first you know, time you know, recorded history came down and anything you know, has ever gone from being a security to not a security. Like, that's just not a thing that happens for anything other than tokens, right? You, you know what? I'm you Jewish and I got your joke, which, which should tell you something. But okay, just r r real quick. The, but, you know, what, what's happened with proof of stake, I'm not, I'm not saying the government's right, but it's introduced the argument that mm. now this thing has sort of had a, a after-the-fact issuer, or the enterprise may have been distributed or decentralized when it issued. But now it's sort of reconsolidated like a star gathering of dust, and someone mm -hmm. can become like a successor issuer. I can see that argument being launched, and that, that, that mm -hmm. I think proof of stake is has its place. I'm not anti proof quite, of stake, but it, it's a little it's tricky quite, legally. It's delicate. It's really delicate. I mean, um, are, are you familiar with the Norwegian rule? Uh, eat sardines. No, I don't know. Uh, what? So, so, you know, we typically have the Howey test discussed as being how the SEC operates and so on. But in practice, the Howey test is not what the SEC uses. The SEC actually uses the Norwegian rule. Uh, and the Norwegian rule, as it applies to, um, well, the, the original statement of the Norwegian rule is everything which is fun is either fattening or immoral. Okay. Right. So as the SEC applies the Norwegian rule, anything that an American wants to buy is a security, and anything that an American does not want to buy is not a security. Right? They, they really have a kind of Jimmy Carter-esque desire to look inside of the heart of the American, and if the American's heart is filled with the desire of financial reward and then they purchase something on that basis, the SEC will find some way of making that thing into a security. <clears throat> and de facto, the Howey test... Because it's de facto the Howey test is a way of achieving that goal, but the SEC's fundamental desire is to stop Americans speculating because of the way that Americans speculate. I you say know, that, and, sir. And I'm sorry, some that, but kidding, kidding aside, there, there's the Howey test is so they're just for the for the for the, for the group. The, the federal standard is the Howey test on whether something an investment contract is in place and would therefore security. But the Howey test was the result of a diff disagreement between the 50 states. The Howey test was the majority opinion, but the minority opinion, which applies in California also, is something called the risk capital test, which is much looser than the Howey test. It's basically, are you putting in money into a speculative venture? It doesn't worry about the common enterprise and, and blah, 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 blah. It just kind of takes a, you know, is it, are you buying a country club spot before the country club is built? Okay, fine. You're risking your capital. It's a, it's a security. So the, the, the SEC sort of moved towards the Norwegian influence, I guess you call it the risk capital test. And I'm, if you can see from what Gensler's doing and they're, and they're revising of the definition of what an exchange is, 
that they're vastly overreaching and it's really annoying to see it. And mm -hmm. I'm going to pass it to Bernd. I think mm -hmm. you, you were raising your I hand think, or had something to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to say that you guys are actually selling Avada right now and, and the SEC is Good. doing too. Good, because I'm glad. When they, shut down, <laughs> when they shut down the service for Kraken, the, the stake, uh, proof of stake service that Kraken provided in the US, that was actually, they almost recommended to use, use your home appliance because it's, it's a centralized service. It's a, they, it's a custodial service. So they have the keys and they shouldn't do that for you. It mm -hmm. should be you doing it for yourself. And, right. and this is exactly what we, what we sort of sell. We just, it's, it just needs to be convenient because Kraken and all these services are so convenient. You know, that's the point. People don't don't do this because they they want to have uh, um, yeah they they want to stake but they want to have as less technical knowledge or technical intervention as as possible. So um, yeah, that's that's what they can do with with an Avada. And we have fifty percent of our uh, community is based in in the US. So we we sell worldwide, but we see that uh, from the seventy countries that we sold so far. 50% is our customers from the US. So that's, but and to go and to, to that uh, distribution of, we, we talked about the, the, the coefficient and, and everything. It's a, it's a really cool project. I mean, th this is just a thing that should have been by default for all the proof of stake blockchains from the beginning. You know, everybody if, doing a proof of stake blockchain. One could argue all blockchains. Us. Well, yeah. I mean, Anastasia, support... did, did you, I think my wonderful co host had a question or a comment. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to ask, like, can you briefly explain, so Avado, what would be the alternative if, like, one wants to set a node um, himself? So would you just, like, do it on your computer, download everything, have this terabyte of memory in place? So basically, that would need to be, like, a standalone device that would be running a node or multiple nodes. So basically, there's not really an alternative to having Avado. And maybe I can combat uh, uh, quickly. I mean, um, I can so just Avado just saves you from doing it yourself, right? They just save you all the trouble, which is a beautiful so thing. Like everything is preset. Like you just you just buy it and you just run it and that's it. It's a plug and play blockchain interface. Yeah, exactly. Should have been so. built as uh, Vinay was saying. It should have been built decades ago. Well, maybe not decades, <laughs> but you know, at least five years ago. Well, it should have been. I mean, it should have been standard, right? Proof of stake is a transition. You know, the proof of stake process should also have involved most of the people involved in Ethereum running a home node. And that should have been an integral part of the proof of stake process. Mm -hmm. Because totally. what proof of stake should have given us was both practical and legal armor against regulatory capture. There's this beautiful structure in America called the Private Member Association. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to waive all regulatory uh, rulings and uh, and uh, limits uh, within that organization, <clears throat> so long as you're not uh, subverting the U.S. <laughs> in some way, which, of course, that's a relative term. Okay, for the but audience, that, a sorry, decentralized the that's network. A fantastically rough approximation of the law, but Marco, thanks for putting on your shirt. Bye, Please God. continue. We're not going to dive in deep on this one, Gordon. Come on, let's okay. be fair. And, and right. hi, hi, hi but the point being is it's good seeing you. Uh, the whole point of, of that thing was that people would have the freedom to do what they wanted to do uh, within the construct of this PMA. And as long as they weren't damaging other people in, in so doing, they were pretty much free to do. And a decentralized network is literally approaching what you would consider to be a PMA status in the sense that it is proof of or it's it's protected against regulatory oversight because the only participants who are benefiting from and or participating in the uh, uh, network system whatever you want it, the people that work or system and that's really sort of the fundamental thing about decentralization is that all actors have control over collectively have control over the system Right. And proof of stake does that because proof of stake does not allow delegation, by the way. That's that's one thing. Delegation, you're starting to tread into that whole. Now, that's more like a security because the majority of participants are not running the network. 
right? Uh, In a proof of stake world, all running the network. It's a very well, tricky ideally <laughs> very tricky because the question about whether or not you can or can't delegate is a question of telling other people what they can and can't do with their private property. Right, but that's, that's what America does. Right, if I own <laughs> that's what America like, does. <laughs> maybe. Um, so I want to. I want to. I mean, that's what taxes around. are about. They tell you how to spend your money. Complicated. So I want to. I want to swing back around to something here about um, the notion of the relationship between the hardware layer and the what you might call the political economy of the chain. Right. Mm -hmm. So my sort of moment of having the kind of decentralization realization was when we first got ASIC mining in Bitcoin. So 2010, 2011, 2012, people were mining Bitcoin on their laptops. Uh, I was not mining Bitcoin on my laptop because I was currently working with uh, the US federal government. I didn't fancy trying to explain to people if there was an incident, why I had a bunch of weird looking cryptography sitting on my machine. Uh, why does your whole machine have this very strange program running on it, Mr. Gupta? I just didn't want to be there. Um, so then, you know, the word comes over the horizon that they're moving to ASIC mining. And ASIC mining has massive economies of scale, right? So when it was everybody mining Bitcoin at home on their laptops, you had already paid for the laptop. And then you were running a subsidized activity, which was the hardware was paid for because you thought was the machine you were using to play video games. And then you would run it overnight and it would mine Bitcoin. You basically had the cost of the electricity. As long as the cost of the electricity subsidized by a home use was more efficient than building a custom machine, the network would stay decentralized because it was economically inefficient to centralize it. You needed the other uses of that hardware in the daylight to subsidize the nighttime mining activity. As soon as you got the ASICs and you got centralization uh, because of the capital requirements of doing ASIC production, and you got a positive feedback loop where the biggest players got a higher rate of return on their capital than the smaller players, what we got was the introduction of an economics of oligarchy, which were not originally anticipated inside of the Bitcoin spec. Right? Satoshi did not expect ASIC mining to come and centralize the Bitcoin network in the hands of big capital. The network was originally assumed that, you know, to run in a form where Bitcoin was a thing that you made rather than Bitcoin being a thing that you bought. So we've already gone through this loop once already. Vinny, I'm Bitcoin sorry. Are you sure about that? Was, wasn't that part of the whole SegWit discussion? Are you... Are you oh, it, goes, you it goes all the way back. Sorry, go on. Look, I, I'm, not, I'm not claiming expertise, but you, you said something like Satoshi did not envision... A group of large miners. I, I think, given the the increasing complexity of the math problem that needs to get solved, it, it was inevitable. Well, but it, but it's economic, right? So, if the most efficient way of doing Bitcoin computation is a machine which is being used in an office for eight hours a day and has already been paid for for that purpose, and then you're just using spare capacity you're in a completely different situation than if the most economic way of doing the mining is on a custom silicon device that was made exactly for that purpose. Yeah. And whether it's more efficient to mine on a laptop or mine on an ASIC depends on the algorithm. So Chia comes along and Chia has an algorithm which they say is more efficient to do with the spare capacity on a hard drive than it is to build custom data centers. Correct. Right. Hey, so hey Paul, just... do you want to join in? You, you had a question or a comment? Do you want to do me a favor? Put on your video. Uh, no, no I'm, I'm, um, no, I'm, um, Vinye, the way you're describing it, that's where I entered the space. So keep going. Uh, so I was just going to say, dedicated machines. And, yeah. There's a very complex relationship between the hardware platform, the algorithm running on the hardware platform, right. and the legal, technical, regulatory governance landscape. Right. And tiny little changes to the algorithms can completely dramatically tip what the natural economic form is. So about five, six years ago, the big topic in the Ethereum world was ASIC-resistant mining. To make mining algorithms where it was more efficient to mine on a consumer laptop than it was to mine on a custom silicon device. <laughs> and idea. if we had ever found an algorithm that was appropriately ASIC-resistant, then you might have seen an economy where Ethereum was largely mined on laptops at home rather than being mined with custom silicon. So, Vinay, are, are you familiar with Avato? Have you had a chance to see it, or have you guys connected at all? Oh, I, yeah, I understand what they're doing. Yes, I, I have a pretty good handle on that. And, and what's, your, what's your take? And yeah, I, I guess um, be nice because they're on the show. <laughs> Go on. Everybody, well, everybody doing all the chains that are doing proof of stake mm -hmm. should have a strategy for getting 
let's say 20% of the people that use their network staking, right? Okay. You know, what you want in a proof of stake transition is you want tens of thousands of nodes that are all staking, that are all independent, that are scattered around the world, that are running their own hardware at home, because the physical distribution of the network and the legal distribution of the network between individuals and between jurisdictions mm -hmm. makes it incredibly difficult to control the network, right. unlike the Ethereum situation where you just take the exchanges by the neck and you tell them what the rules are. Right. All right. So, so I, 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 you're right. I, I like the Avado idea because you know I, I wasn't thinking about this before. It, it actually strengthens the network itself. It's not just a way for right. consumer to own it at home. Massively, really massively. Right. Okay. So decentralization is a strength. Right. Of yes. course. So absolutely, guys. For 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 the five year old here, is what are the chances or the odds of ISPs or governments interdicting the network traffic relating to the consensus protocol? Like does does it happen over an encrypted channel? Can, can they coin block a, can they block a port? Like, it's a coin toss. It's a coin toss. You're right. I mean, they could do that. There, there are ways that, and it would be a catch a cat and mouse game. But they could do oh, it, yes. and it would cause disruptions, right? And this is, I mean, Gordon, you and I have talked about the 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 pillars I I go on about. But you know, one of them is getting a fully decentralized uh, network so that there is no point of centralization. Mm -hmm. uh, within a, a, a blockchain or an immutable database network uh, distributed globally on platforms like uh, an Avado platform, which are, you know, plug and play. You plug it in, you do go through a little uh, wizard and you're up and you're running. And now you're participating in the network along with everybody else who's in the network. But that gets you to a point where you have this economic system that is out of control. In the as far as regulators are concerned, and they don't like that. So what's their next step? Well, okay, well, we still control the internet because they do. Mm -hmm. uh, because the internet used to be decentralized. Yeah, and then over. it went public and then telcos took control of it. It is not decentralized. Let, let me stop for a second. So it is controlled by the telcos. You, you, you should well that. Great seeing you. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining. Look forward to doing a future show with you. We got that Good in, in the works. Uh, Bert, I, I know, I know you're. Think, think, and Paul, thanks you. Um, Bert, I, I know you have a couple of minutes. We're kind of coming up on the end of the show, anyway. So, if, if someone takes an Avado and they install it at home, you said there's an app store. Is how do they maintain it? Do, do they download firmware and update it? Do they go? Do you have your own app store? Like, how do you keep this thing up and running with the most recent software? I, I'll give this to Stefan again because I, I think that was part of the explanation they wanted to give before. Yeah, I also wanted to uh, sort of comment on uh, on what uh, Anastasia also said. So, so there's like a couple of things that, that make uh, home staking difficult. Eh? The first thing is like selecting the right hardware. Do we need to run it on an old laptop or do I need to purchase uh, specific hardware for that? Mm -hmm. uh, like the second part is sort of the DevOps thing. So uh, you need to install the software on it, but you also need to maintain that software. Because if you if you start yes. staking, it's usually like a long term engagement that you're going on, like for at least a year, maybe two years, three years. You really want to like benefit from this on a long term. But that means like during throughout the three years or even longer, you always need to make sure that you're running the latest versions of all these uh, of that whole software stack. So it's not only the operating system; it's also all the the different aspects of 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 the chain. So because it needs. If, if you look at Ethereum, for example, so you have like the execution layer, you have a beacon chain, uh, you have the validator itself, you also have like a MEV boost if you want. So that's, that's at least like four pieces of software that you need constantly to maintain uh, throughout all that time. Um, so these are some of the some of the things that that make it hard for people to stake at home and and therefore people like uh, and then sort of maybe the third maybe I can also add that into the mix is the capital requirements. It's been a long time. Um, so given these three things, so we are trying to sort of lower the barrier with Avado. So we've taken selecting a hardware out of your hand because we propose the hardware that we uh, composed for you. Uh, for that maintenance, so we have the DAP store. So we, are, so our team from Avado for. So basically, what you do if you buy an Avado device, you're paying a premium on the hardware. So if you would source all mm -hmm. the hardware components yourself, you would end up with a cheaper solution. So you pay a premium to Avado, but that's money. We're actually using that to maintain all that software. 
So included in that price throughout, so it's a lifetime uh, free updates that you get. Uh, and the way that, that our system works, of course, is that by continuously selling devices to people, we can keep a whole team running uh, on our side that constantly monitors all these GitHub repos and builds and tests out all these things, uh, makes them compatible, and also adds this nice UI layer on top of it that makes it super easy for people to uh, to participate in that. So it's like the second part that we do. And then the third part that we do is for that capital requirements. We are also integrating all kinds of uh, liquid staking solutions into Avado. So the idea is that um, if you don't have 30 to eat yourself, but if you have like a group of friends that has some eats lying around, we will provide like smart contracts where you can all deposit your fractions of eat into until you come to the point that you have 30 to eat. And you can take out that 30 to eat and use it to stake. Uh, and so the idea of the smart contracts is that it makes it very easy uh, so that people don't have to necessarily trust each other. So if I would deposit five ETH into such a pool, uh, I would receive an NFT, for example, that, that represents that five ETH of stake that I put in. And then later on, if that group collaboratively decides to exit the validator and stop validating with that 32 ETH, I would be able just to reclaim my five ETH from the smart contract. And I don't need to trust the guy that's actually running uh, the, the computer at home. So it's sort of, so we try to mitigate each a uh, part so each argument that people would have against running hardware at home we're trying to make uh, their uh, sort of mute <laughs> that uh, that argument and so the again these three aspects are the hardware parts uh, the capital requirements part and then the yeah, the software update part and so that's sort of the i think the whole scope of the solution that we are trying to uh, to contribute to the to the ecosystem that's great. Now, I, I've received a few chats. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry for this. I've received a few chats that our guests actually have to go because they can't spend their whole day on this, even though this has been fascinating. Hold on, John. I'll ask your question extremely fast, and then I'm going to let the guests answer it and exit. So you get the last dip, but just be efficient. Yeah. A small question. Uh, is it anywhere, or are you working towards the possibility of making a more decentralized way of actually buying uh, the Avada hardware, because right now, as I understand, you pay with your uh, credit and debit card that is uh, directly related to you as a person. It has your name on it, so it can be very easy to track and find you if you have bought uh, Avada hardware. Yeah, so interestingly enough, so that, that's one of the most recent things. So I can give some alpha here is that we're actually working on a solution where you can uh, use your staking rewards to pay back the device. So the idea would be that you, if you have a 32 ETH as a bond, or if you collectively do it in a pool uh, together with other people, that you would be able just to like to get the Avado device and not pay for it, but then use your uh, your staking rewards to actually pay back the device. So that's sort of amortizes the fact that you first don't have to pay necessarily in uh, in fiat money with your credit cards. And by the way, right now on the website, you can also pay it with DAI. So you can already pay with crypto if you don't want to pay with uh, with credit cards. Now, with I'm going to pause you because we're, we're, we're banging against the wall. Arthur, thank you so much it for coming lovely. on. Really appreciate yes. it. it. It was great. Love to have you on again. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Bernd, thank I, you so I much think you got to go. Thank you. Good one. Um, yeah, just, just if, answer, if you want to just finish your thought, go ahead. But then, then we're going to call it. Or, or I just uh, answer real quick to John because um, the, we need to ship the device. That's that's the part where you don't um, have much anonymity. There's there's a name to it, and uh, we have to ship it to you. If you have a solution for that, then, then I'm happy to hear. The, the, this problem was solved in Russia. So basically what you do, you take a box uh, with Avada and you uh, basically dig it under the ground in different places around cities where people might buy it. And then when the person buys it, you send them the geolocation, the photos of the place. Geohashing, okay. How, how, how much deep you need to dig. You can hide it in a forest somewhere, etc. So this is how drugs are being sold in Russia. So yeah. you can do a similar thing. And it's working very well. So and there's an example of meme marketing from us. Like you go yeah, oh, yeah, meme you marketing. on TikTok and so on and so on. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Geocaching is a very popular thing, uh, a big community. So you can like okay, I, 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 I'm at slightly disreputable note. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. Super.
great show. Really appreciate it. Thanks. You know, let's take a look at Avado. I'll, I'll put the website for it in the show notes. And uh, Anastasia, pleasure co-hosting with you this time. Uh, I'm officially thank stopping you, the recorder. I, I, I want to thank the guests and the panel. It was just really good. So see you next week. Thank you.